Now, just moving on to the outline of our presentation, I'm going to take a little bit of time to give a little bit of background to um, the program and the decision, um, and then go into detail around uh, the actual data that led to the recommendation to stop dosing in Generation HD1. Um, then the, these data have obviously raised a lot of questions, um, and so I will share some of our initial um, questions and things that we're going to be following up. Um, so it's obviously going to, um, there's a lot of questions that we, we can't answer just today and um, give you a bit of an idea of just where our thinking is and, and, and around next steps. And then we'll have um, uh, the Q&A session at the end. Firstly, um, I do just want to take a moment um, on the behalf of the whole team at Roche and Genentech to thank you all and acknowledge the fantastic partnership we um, enjoy with the HD community. We have learned so much and continue to learn so much and this really has been critical um, and will continue to be critical for the Tobinosin program. So thank you for that. Very quickly, um, I just want to um, highlight um, what Tom and Urson, um, is aiming to do. Um, it is testing the Huntington lowering hypothesis. And what that means is that it actually is uh, targeting the underlying cause or what's considered the underlying cause of Huntington's. Uh, it's an antisense oligonucleotide and it binds to Huntington mRNA. And what this ultimately leads to is a reduction in the pro production of Huntington protein. And with tominosin, tominosin is known as a non-allele specific approach. And what this means is it not only reduces the toxic mutant Huntington protein, but it also reduces the normal or wild type protein. So that's the um, premise and the hypothesis or the mechanism of action behind tominosin that we have been testing in our program. This slide is a summary of the clinical development program for Tominosin. Um, it includes the original phase 1-2-A study run by Ionis and the subsequent open label extension study uh, from the, uh, with the same patients. Other studies including the natural history study, which is a non-drug study that is still ongoing, as well as the PKPD study that is um, near completion of the first part thereof. Um, specifically, and what the focus is of today is really our phase three generation HD1 study, uh, which the dosing has stopped, and I'll explain to you um, in detail why that has um, that has happened, as well as GenExtend. And GenExtend is a rollover study from which for participants on the preceding studies on the left have the opportunity to roll in or had the opportunity to roll in. And um, that study is ongoing, but dosing is paused and no new participants are rolling into that study now. Okay, so what happened to Generation HD1? Now, as we shared um, just over six weeks ago, the IDMC, which is an independent data monitoring committee, recommended to stop dosing in Generation HD1 on the basis of an overall benefit risk assessment. So the balance of overall safety versus the overall benefit um, for Tom and Erson that they have seen in the data. And I'll explain the IDMC in a, a little bit more in a moment. The other important thing is that they also recommended to continue to study, and this is to enable the follow-up of participants for um, a clinical and safety outcomes. One thing I do just want to spend a, a minute on, or a, few, uh, yeah, a minute on, is just to explain why um, we needed to um, share this initial announcement via a press release. And this may have come as a bit of a surprise. And, and uh, the, the fact remains that Roche Genentech is a publicly traded company. And so that meant that we were obligated to share this emission, information initially via a press release. We quickly followed it up with letters to investigators, letters to um, patient groups. But I know that this may have caused some um, questions as to why this approach needed to be taken. And hopefully that at least gives a little bit more context to the approach taken to communicate these, this um, obviously very important news. Now I just want to take a minute to, uh, to explain what the Independent Data Monitoring Committee is, or IDMC. 
Now, the IDMC um, was in place for Generation HD1 from the beginning, and it's a common, um, uh, a, a common committee that is in place for such um, large, uh, such studies of, of the nature that Generation HD1 is. And they met regularly, um, like every four months, um, to look at the overall um, the safety data and um, evaluate the, this benefit risk, so the overall risk versus the potential benefit for study participants. And they receive data on an ongoing, well, on this regular scheduled um, uh, basis to enable, to do so. And importantly, this um, committee um, is, it consists of experts, including expert neurologists and HD specialists. So they're very, very um, a capable uh, group to make this assessment. What they do in these regular uh, intervals is they review data um, uh, from, um, the, from the clinical study and it, they actually do it in an unblinded way. So Roche, Genentech, when a study of this nature is ongoing, it remains blinded as well as the investigators and participants to which group in the, um, in the study uh, participants are assigned to, i.e. are they assigned to a treatment arm, a tomonosin arm, or a placebo arm. And this is to enable sort of an unbiased assessment of potential drug effects. The IDMC actually, uh, they're independent to Roche, so they do not Roche, work for Roche, and they receive um, unblinded data. So they can actually assess um, what the effects are on in individual groups, knowing whether they're receiving drug or placebo. So that means they can make a very, um, very robust assessment. And at these regular intervals, they recommend whether a study continues or any changes or, or needs to, or whether or not it can continue or not. And in this case, in March, March um, sorry, my screen's not working. Yeah, in March, uh, on the basis of data, in the study through month 17 or week 69, and this is a common, you'll, you'll hear this a lot, week 69, which is equivalent to month 17 time point. They had a, a substantial amount of data available for patients across all the three dosing arms of generation HD1. And based on that review, they recommended to stop dosing can, and continue the study, however, to evaluate the um, clinical and safety outcomes. Now the study for generation HD1 was designed to, for 25 months. So it, it is an early, the stop is earlier than, so the study was not completed. So the, the, the dosing um, that we had planned to did not complete, but it was enough to enable such an evaluation. And I will now take you through um, in detail um, the specific information and data the IDMC used to come to this recommendation. Before we go into the data, there's a, 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 an important message um, around the fact that this is not the final data from this study. What data I will show you today and what this is the data the IDMC looked at was based on a pre-planned regular cut um, in February. And at this time, 60%, around 60% of participants had reached the week 69 time point or the month 17 time point. So they hadn't reached the 25 months, but they had reached well over halfway of um, the treatment um, duration. And what data, the data that we, I have shared to share today was what data the IDMC had, and that includes patient characteristics when they first started in the study, and then efficacy outcomes across multiple measures, which I'll share, as well as safety data. Importantly, what there's a lot of data that we don't have, Obviously, important, the data that we did ha do have is enough to make this recommendation, but we still will learn a lot um, with data that's still to come. So that includes the, uh, the full, well, the more, more complete data set of the clinical and safety data. We expect around another 10% of data. Um, we don't expect the, the results to change, but the actual specific numbers will change. Um, so, we can't, you know, that's why we need to um, reiterate that this is preliminary. The other thing is, because this was unexpected and not planned um, for this early stop of dosing, we have a lot of samples still in the fridge or freezer that haven't been shipped yet. So we haven't actually got any of our biomarker data. By biomarker, I mean like CSF, Newton, Huntington, neurofilament light, NFL, or, um, or even pharmacokinetic data. And this is the data of how the body processes 
um, a Tominus and this is, um, we're working with a lot of urgency and the logistics pulling this all together. And so we will have this information later in the year, but we, we don't have that today. There's also a lot of other data collected in the study, um, including digital um, that we don't have yet, but we will share once we do. Okay, now I'm just, this, I skipped quickly to it, but this is a very important slide. This is the overall summary of the preliminary data. And I'm starting with this and I'll finish with this, but in between explain all of the pieces of information that has led to this conclusion. The first important point, however, is this first bullet. And that is that generate the study, Generation HD1, was run so well and um, it has enabled us to, to evaluate clearly the differences between the different arms. And what, that, what I mean by that is that we can interpret the data from this study. And so that's already a very important point about how well this study um, was run with obviously a lot of very um, significant community support and commitment from the investigators and sites and participants. Still, um, what that overall, um, the overall assessment from the IDNC was not what we'd hoped. And that is that based on an overall benefit risk assessment of the data through 17 months, they recommended to stop dosing in all study arms. Now this was an overall um, recommendation for the study, but there are, there are differences between the different arms of Tom and Erson. So the different dosing arms tested in the study in the 120 milligram every eight weeks arm, um, which is the more frequent um, dosing arm of Tom and Erson, Tom and Erson was considered unfavorable compared to placebo. So we, we were hoping it to look better and instead it actually look unfavorable compared to placebo. And I'll take you through the data um, behind that. So the 120 milligrams every 16 weeks, so this is a less frequent uh, dose, um, but so less, less off, dose less often, but it's the same dose amount, 120 milligrams. The benefit risk assessment was, or the profile was not as clear. In fact, the safety profile appeared comparable to placebo. However, there was no apparent benefit observed. And so when on balance, that, the, um, that, that leads to the recommendation that that's not, and the, not expected to um, lead to benefit. So we're stopping the sum also. And I'll take you through the data that supports that recommendation also. The first thing before going into the efficacy at clinical outcomes and safety is just a very brief summary of the characteristics of patients that we recruited in this study. And this is an important assessment that is done before you look at data um, from the study, just to make sure that there's in, the, the patients in each arms, each of the groups are similar enough so we can make a, um, a robust comparison. And what you can see here, and this is reflected on other slides that we have tables, is the 120 milligram every eight weeks arm versus the 120 milligram every 16 weeks arm of Tom and Erson versus placebo. And on the characteristics shown here, including age, CAG um, repeats at baseline and stage, we show that we see that the all treatments groups were well balanced, roughly at 40, well, 48, 49 age on average, 45 CAG repeats at baseline on average, and approximately one half of the participants in each arm is um, represent uh, a, a stage one. Um, and so that's a TFC score of 13, to 10, uh, 13 12 or 11. The, most of the remaining participants are um, within stage two. So a more advanced stage um, with some in the, the stage three or four. The other thing we look at when about before looking evaluating um, results from a clinical trial is whether patients, there's equal um, amount of doses or treatments um, received in each of the groups and whether there's a disproportionate discontinuation rate between one group or the other. And discontinuation mean like early stopping of the study or stopping of dosing. And um, there's a lot of numbers here, but just the one things to focus on is that we that looking at the discontinuation rates and in brackets, these are the percentages. All of these, whether it's in the every eight weeks, every 16 weeks, or placebo arms are under 10%, which is well under what we had 
um, thought or predicted up front when we designed the study. So that's a great achievement um, because this Generation HD1 was is a um, is a large and a, you know it is a long study. So um, it was very good to see that the discontinuation rates were quite low. The other thing to see on this slide is um, how many or well, the percentage of patients that had reached the month 17 or WIC 69 time point. And this was above 60%, as I've mentioned before. And this is important. So that means that we can be confident that this is a representative, um, this data that we uh, that I show is representative of the full um, participants, that, uh, the full enrolled participants. The last point I will raise is that um, COVID is um, obviously the pandemic still ongoing and did have some impact on um, our study on Generation HD1 in the April-May timeframe, um, one roughly around one third of patients in each group missed one dose or one visit. Um, and um, we don't expect that that to make a big impact on the results, but just to be clear, the results that I'm showing you today does not account for that. It just assumes everyone received the treatment um, doses that they had that was planned up front. And that will, we will look into this um, in our subsequent analyses. But again, we don't expect that. That's not, not won't change the overall message, but it will help us understand a little bit more of what we're seeing. Okay, I'm now going to move on to the clinical or efficacy outcomes section of my presentation. One of the messages here is that it, this assessment was not just based on one outcome or one measure or one assessment, it was based on multiple assessments. Um, the, the first, um, first four me measures are from the Unified Huntington's Disease Rating Scale or the UHDRS, which is a very well-known um, uh, uh, outcome scale in um, Huntington's. It is composed of the total functional capacity or TFC, the total motor score or TMS, as well as two cognitive measures, the symbol digit modality test, which is STMT, or Stroop Word Reading Test. And this is acronym is S, uh, SWRT. Now these four together make up what's known as the composite UHDRS or CUHDRS. And that includes all four of these measures in one into one overall score. And before I go through the data on each of these um, scales, I will go to give you a quick brief overview of what they're measuring. Additional assessments that are um, data for which we have and I will share is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment or MOCA and Clinical Global Impression Severity Score or CGIS. And again, I will take you through a very brief overview of what each of these is measuring so that you help, that helps you um, when you're looking at the results. Now, moving on, I will start with the total functional capacity score or the TFC. Now, the TFC looks at overall functioning across five different categories. The clinician evaluates functioning on the work domain, how well an individual is able to do their uh, work, manage finances, undertake domestic chores, carry out activities of daily living, as well as, as what their level of care is at the time of the assessment. And then the scores of each of these five um, areas are added up into one overall score, and the highest score is a 13. And a higher score indicates higher functioning. I'm now going to go through the first data slide. And on this first data slide, I'm actually going to spend a bit of time orientating you to some of the specifics so you can help you read the results as, you, as I talk you through it. And this will be, um, this will be uh, intended to help you look, um, interpret or uh, uh, review the uh, follow on um, data slides because they're set up in a very similar fashion. So first data slide, the TFC. What we're looking at here is the change in the TFC from baseline to week 69 or month 17. Before I go through the data, a few orientation points. That this, what's known as the y-axis is the TFC score or change from change score. The x-axis here, um, that is the time scale. And in this case, we're looking at over weeks, so weeks 5, 21, 37, 
53 or 69, and this is the month 17 time point. We're showing the three dosing arms, um, different colors. So the 120 milligram tomonersin every eight weeks is blue, every 16 weeks orange and placebo is gray. The other thing to note is that the dots represent the average scores in each, in each group. And the 95% confidence interval, which is this band, and what that really means is that the majority of patients in each of these groups um, fall within this range. Okay, now the data. TFC is expected to do decrease over time in Huntington's disease. So the first thing to point out is that all groups in our study did decline over time. So that helps us um, assess that this, this will help us, we can trust the comparison of the different arms. We had hoped for Tominosin that we would see an improvement of our, or improved outcome of the Tominosin arms versus the placebo arm. Unfortunately, that is not what we have seen. In fact, the every eight week Tominosin arm has declined more than placebo. The every eight, 16 week declined on the number basis average more. But in fact, the, there is actually a, quite a lot of overlap between uh, in the confidence bands. So we can't really see much of a difference here. And we can't interpret that. But this pattern is very important and it's consistent across multi, all of the measures pretty much that I will show you in that the every eight weeks is declines or is worse relative to every 16 weeks relative to placebo. I'm now going to move to the TFC, sorry, the TMS, the total motor score. Now this is a scale, there's 31 um, items that the clinician rates um, and there's an overall score of 124. And uh, um, two examples are shown here, the clinician assesses the career score, whether absence or present, and then if present, the severity of career present in the participant. And another example is the ability to tandem walk. Now, these scores are all added up, up to a top uh, score of 124. And in contrary to um, the TFC I just went through, a, high, a lower score is better motor function or less impairment. So that's important when orientation when we come to the results now. This is the change in TMS from baseline to week 69. As in HD, it is expected that the scores increase over time and this, increase, this re reflects um, in increasing impairment or reduced motor function. So all groups did this, so that um, makes we have an interpretable study. The every eight weeks um, shows more impairment on a number basis versus placebo, and the placebo slightly more than the Q16. Still, the overlap, there's quite a lot of overlap in the, um, in the confidence bands. What this shows, though, that contrary to what we had hoped and what we showed improved outcome, Tominosin versus placebo, this is not the case um, as shown here. Next is the, the first of the two cognitive assessments. And this is, cognition is how well an individual thinks, processes information, remembers things. The STMT or the simple digital modality test is a test where you, um, the individual needs to match numbers with symbols. There's a key up here. And this is, um, this is these matches, uh, um, the individual matches as many as they can in a short period of time. And then the number of, um, correct answers um, is as added up. And a higher score indicates better cognitive performance. This is the results for SGMT. Um, like in the others, all, uh, ultimately there's decline in function over time as expected in HD in all groups. Consistent pattern, however, not what we hoped. Um, in, uh, instead of being a better outcome than placebo, we see um, the decline in function to um, be the, uh, the biggest difference between the every eight weeks versus placebo um, and then the Q16 versus placebo. So this is this pattern I've referred to that Q8 more decline Q, relative to Q16 and then Q16 more uh, decline relative to the placebo. Now moving on to the Stroop word reading test. Now this is the second cognitive assessment from the UHGRS. 
Now, individuals are asked to read these words, which are wor words describing um, colors, as, um, as read as many as possible over a short period of time, and then a score is given of how many are correct. And the higher score indicates better cognitive performance, just the same as with SDMT. Here are the results for Stroop Word Reading Test. All groups at through to six, week 69 showed decline as expected in HD. But as we did not expect or hope uh, for Tom and Osen, the every eight weeks showed more decline relative to placebo. New, the numbers of the averages are uh, more decline for the every 16 weeks. However, this is, as I said before and others, there is a lot of overlap in these um, confidence bands. So we can't say uh, for sure if there's a difference there. But again, um, like with the other measures, we did not see um, an improved outcome versus placebo with Tominos. Now these four, as I mentioned before, these four scales, the TFC, the TMS, SDMT and Stroop word reading, all can uh, are added up into a composite score so called the CUHDRS. Now the, the way this is set up is that a higher score indicates overall less impairment. Now looking at the results for the CUHDRS, and this is the same change in CUHDRS from baseline to week 69. First, the first thing to note is that all groups decline over time, which is expected in Huntington's disease. But as we not, as not contrary to what we had hoped, the every eight weeks, Q6, sorry, Q, every eight weeks hominose and arm showed more decline versus placebo. On a numbers average basis, that so did the um, every 16 weeks harm. However, there is overlap here um, uh, as, as with as shared in the previous um, assessments. So again, uh, this, uh, based on the CUHDRS, which is including all of these different four scales into one composite scale, we did not see that Tom and Urson leads to improved outcome, outcomes versus placebo. Mm -hmm. The next one is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment or MOCA. And now this is a score that has a number of different tests that the participant goes through. And it's just an overall global cognitive function, measure of cognitive function. And this complements what we um, look at in the SDMT and Stroop word reading test. And the overall score is up to 30 with a high, the higher score means less impairment. This is the slide with the data for um, the MOCA. We want the first thing to see is that the mean changes from baseline remain above um, baseline scores. So that means there's no, on average, um, work, um, decrease in function based on this on the MOCA from baseline. But one thing we do notice that's quite consistent with the previous assessments is that every eight weeks dosing arm um, does show a differential profile to the other groups um, and so more decline or um, a difference in the, um, the numerically worse um, versus placebo in, in the every 16 week. Um, so this is a consistent um, pattern as we saw in the other assessments. The last clinical outcome is the Clinical Global Impression Severity or CGIS score. And this is a score from zero to 10 and this assessment of an overall severity of uh, an individual. And as it, um, expected in HD, all three arms increased in their disease sever severity over time. Um, there's quite a lot of overlap in, in the, the um, confidence bar bands in this particular measure, but the pattern that we've seen on the other um, exists and is replicated. So we see that every eight weeks is worse, uh, as shows more decline um, in function, well, more, sorry, increase in severity versus the every 16 um, dosing arm versus placebo. So all of these assessments, all of the symptomatic data from these multiple different um, assessments um, and outcome measures led to the conclude preliminary, well, the, the conclusion that um, 120 milligrams every eight weeks of tominosin leads to an unfavorable, uh, it was unfavorable compared to placebo. And those that there was no apparent benefit observable for the every 16 weeks arm. Now that's the clinical efficacy data. 
Now I'll move to the safety because this was what, together with the efficacy of the safety, is evaluated for this overall benefit risk assessment. <clears throat> Firstly, um, this is a table of adverse events or side effects. Um, we've got first the, the every eight weeks versus every 16 weeks versus placebo. First thing, there's lots of data here, but just to point out is overall this roughly the same percentage of patients experience an adverse event or side effect. So there's no real difference across the arms there. But one thing that we do notice is that in the every eight weeks, more frequent arm, more participants experience serious adverse events. And in general, the every 16 weeks arm is, not, uh, is no different to placebo. This is also reflected when we look a little bit more specifically into what kind of adverse events were observed. Overall, the most common events were observed included falls, post lumbar puncture syndrome, procedural pain, headaches and dizziness. In general, the numbers or percentages of patients experiencing these were higher in the every eight weeks and the every 16 weeks was comparable to placebo. We also looked at brain imaging data um, in this study and I will take you through that data. Firstly, we look at the, the whole brain, so the that massive brain tissue as a whole, as well as specific areas in the chordate um, and as well, which is a deep a, a, a structure right in um, deep into in the brain that's important, um, that's in particularly um, affected in Huntington's disease and ventricles. And ventricles are the gaps in between the brain tissue, which contains cerebrospinal fluid. Now it's important to know that the whole brain shrinks a little bit in, in with normal aging, and particularly in Huntington's, um, as well as like the chordate regions. There are some atrophy, as we call it, like reduced brain mass over time, as well as an increase in the vent size of ventricles over time um, uh, with aging and Huntington's. So what that means, it's very important that we have a, a placebo arm in the study so we can compare tominosin effects versus placebo on these um, parameters. Whole brain, so the whole brain mass, um, we saw no drug-related differences in whole brain atrophy, which what I mean by that is the decrease in brain mass over time for tominosin versus placebo at week 69. We also saw no drug-related differences in the um, atrophy or decrease in um, mass of the chordate over time as measured by MRI imaging for tominosin versus placebo. What we did see, what drug-related uh, change we did see was an increase in the ventricular volume through to the week 69 time point. And um, the, for the every eight weeks, it, on average, the increase in volume was 24% versus the every 16 weeks, which is 17% versus 11% in placebo. Now, obviously, as mentioned, this we do see a difference related to tominosin versus placebo. The important thing, however, is the vast majority of participants and patients in the study did not, um, these changes or increases in ventricular volumes did not lead to a clinical syndrome or clinical symptoms associated with this, um, this finding. And we have been monitoring very closely from the beginning in this study. And so there's a, a rigorous assessment and monitoring and follow-up of participants. That being said, we are very interested and we will be looking very carefully about how, how these um, changes, um, what, what, what happens to these um, increased ventricular volumes over time as we, as we follow patients um, after they stop drug. This is the last data slide. This is just a summary of other key safety data that we have available now. The first is the protein and white blood cells in the spinal fluid. Um, now these, um, the reason we look for these is it can be a sign of infection or inflammation. What we did see in the results is that the protein in the spinal fluid, and this is the fluid in the spinal cord, and that also then um, bathes the brain through the ventricles. The protein was increased in the every eight week group versus the every 16 week and placebo group. So that we, saw, um, effect, um, we saw a signal there. And we've also seen an increase in incidence of white, increases in white blood cells in the spinal fluid in both treatment groups, which we will be investigating. <clears throat> 
Uh, platelet, we looked at the um, platelet, uh, effects on platelets, which uh, cells that help blood, helps the blood clot, as well as kidney function and liver function. And we did not see any changes or risk um, with the tominosin versus placebo on these parameters. We also looked at the Columbia suicide severity scale. And this is a measure that has the severity of a participant's suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And we did not see any um, differences in the groups or a signal in the Tominosin group for this. So this last slide is a summary of what I've just taken you through safety. Overall, there was no new um, or emerging safety signals um, identified for Tominosin uh, based on this 19, 17 months data point of time point. Um, what we did, can say though, there is a difference in um, the assessment for the two different dosing arms. The 120 milligram every eight weeks is less tolerated compared to the every 16 weeks and placebo arm. And this is mostly driven by higher incidence in specific adverse events, this higher brain ventricular volume increase that I just went through, as well as higher numbers of, with the protein um, increases I mentioned. The conclusion is different for the 120 milligrams every 16 weeks. In fact, the safety profile is overall comparable to placebo, so not different to placebo. Um, there are less overall AEs in, in terms of numbers, um, but we did see this increase in brain particular volume that we'll be investigating. But again, this was of less magnitude than that observed with the every eight week dosing. So I'm now back to the slide I started with, and this is the overall summary, which integrates both the clinical outcome data and the safety. So overall, based on the assessment of data through this to the 17 months or 69 week time point, the IDMC recommended to stop dosing in all arms. And the reason for that is that the 120 milligrams every eight weeks um, dosing arm uh, was unfavorable compared to placebo. And the, while the 120 milligram dosing arm had a safety profile that appeared comparable to placebo, and there was no apparent benefit observed. So there was no um, rationale to continue dosing participants in this study uh, on that dosing arm either. Now, of course, this is absolutely not the results that we were hoping for, any of us were hoping for. Um, and it obviously, um, it is a setback. Um, however, what we can look forward to now is, you know, we, there's a number of questions that have been um, raised by the data, and we're going to work hard to try and get answer these questions. So really, like the fundamental question overarching all of this is, why did the Generation HD1 study not show a positive result? And we have a large number of questions that these results have asked, um, have raised and things that we're going to look at once we have the data that's coming in over, over the course of the year. For example, is there a dose or exposure, so an amount of tominosin that affects the different results? We've just looked at the dose in arms, but we we'll, can dig in a little bit more detail because um, not, ev not everybody gets the same amount of drug on board when they have the same dose. And we will look at the, is there any relationships of biomarkers such as CSF mutant Huntington to explain the drug responses we've seen. We'll also to see whether there are certain patient characteristics that change the response or well, disease stage, for example, um, um, has that, does that alter the response? There are also fundamental questions around the actual approach, the total hunt, well, the Huntington lowering approach, is there a threshold that we need to be mindful of and, and dosing um, tominosin? There's also questions around the approach and the delivery directly into the spinal fluid of an azo, um, and we will be looking at the overall tolerability um, questions of that approach, of the, of the tominosin approach. Importantly, um, there are very important next steps for Generation HD1 and GenXten studies in the meantime, while we gather the data and analyze further. Dosing has stopped or been paused, but both studies continue. And it's incredibly important that participants think very carefully and, and consider continuing in the study, despite the fact that no more dosing. And this firstly, it's because we need to and want to, and it's important to, follow them individually for their clinical and safety outcomes after they're finished dosing. And overall, all of this data that they've 
their, their participation has already and will continue to provide will be important for overall understanding of Huntington lowering approach. So really, really important for things to consider. Um, the patient, importantly though, um, patients will not be told which group they were in until the end of the study. And so they're gonna stay blinded. They don't will not know if they're on placebo on every eight weeks or every 16 weeks. And the reason for that is that we need to do, keep the blind because the study's going and it, this enables the most robust assessment of the data. So we can learn even as much as possible from this study. Gen extend dosing, we say it's paused. And the reason we say paused and not stopped is we just need to take some time to review all of the data that's still incoming to understand. And that will help us assess the next steps. Okay. Uh, I'm at the, my last slide. I do just want to make some very la important last points. Last points. This, these results and the, the premature or early um, stopping of Generation HD1 is most definitely not it, what any one of us wanted, and, it's, and it is very disappointing. Um, but importantly, the study needs to the study continues, and we will learn a lot more from um, the, the remaining data that we will collect. Overall, the commitment for study participants, investigators and study sites have already, has already given us a lot of information, but even more will come um, with these studies um, continuing. And overall, what we can learn will be very, very helpful for defining what next steps are for Tom and Erson, but also the Huntington lowering approach, um, so for the whole community. So our commitment um, as Rose Genentech is that we are acquiring, we're working with as much urgency to acquire the sample data and analyze and have a look at this all together and share what we learn from this with, with the community as soon as we possibly can. And then on the basis of this, we will update the community on next steps for Tom and Erson as soon as possible also. So with that, I just want to end with a very, very important uh, message, and that is just a thank you to all the study participants, um, their families, investigator and site networks, as well as the HD community as a whole. It's, um, it's as mentioned at the beginning, it's none of this, the, time of the study, the Generation HD1, and what we learned from this would not be possible without all of your help and collaboration and partnership. So thank you. <laughs>